In the previous video, we looked at the independent investigation of truth, and as well looking at how the Baha'i faith from its own perspective and from its own writings does not seek to belittle or diminish the achievements and the beauty of previous expressions of the divine will, such as in Christianity, Judaism, Islam, Buddhism, Hinduism, or Zoroastrianism, um, and that it seeks not to dwarf any of the prophets of the past. In this one, in this section, we're going to begin quickly with an uh, exploration of how the Baha'i writings look at one's traditional faith, meaning that we often grow up and become the very tradition that our parents and ancestors have followed. We're then going to move into a section on uh, secularism, atheism, and rationality, and then look at the idea of syncretism. The idea that, in some sense, the Baha'i Faith is a mere hodgepodge or smorgasbord of uh, various beliefs that have sort of been thrown together. Dear friends, thank you for joining us. Um, please note that this is only a personal interpretation of the Baha'i teachings. If you wish to have an authoritative stance, please go to Baha'i.org. I want to thank the Baha'i Administration, all those working in their neighborhoods, and anyone who's trying to work for the betterment of the world. Please note that in the description below you'll be able to find an MP3 version of this, so you don't have to watch it, um, but also a PDF of all the quotes that will be used in any of the deepenings, and timestamps of the different sections. And please subscribe if you'd like to be alerted for any upcoming videos. This section is a brief exploration of the topic of the independent investigation and the search for truth. Uh, please see the importance of knowledge, reason, and independent investigation in another deepening on this channel. Man must cut himself free from all prejudice and from the result of his own imagination, so that he may be able to search for truth unhindered. Truth is one in all religions and by means of it the unity of the world can be realized. All the peoples have a fundamental belief in common. Being one, truth cannot be divided, and the difference that appear to exist among the nations only result from their attachment to prejudice. If only men would search out truth, they would find themselves united. In this quote, Abdul Baha states, that all people have a fundamental belief in common. Truth cannot be divided. And then he states that the differences that appear to exist among the nations result from what? Our attachment to prejudice. And that if man would search out truth, we would find ourselves united. That we have to try to put aside our prejudice, as difficult as that might be, and search for truth unhindered. That he then states, truth is one in all religions and by means of it the unity of the world can be realized. That it is only once we can see, just as racially, we have to be able to see that we are all human, or on gender lines that we are equal, we have to be able to see that all of these different expressions from the Divine Being are actually, through investigation, one. And then we can actually see the unity of humankind in this collective narrative that has actually been playing out over the millennia. God has conferred upon and added to man a distinctive power, the faculty of intellectual investigation into the secrets of creation, the acquisition of higher knowledge, the greatest virtue of which is scientific enlightenment. This endowment is the most praiseworthy power of man, for through its employment and exercise, the betterment of the human race is accomplished, the development of the virtues of mankind is made possible, and the spirit and mysteries of God become manifest. This is such a sweet quote. Um, it was something that, because while I was raised in a Catholic household, I became a secularist myself. Um, I always had this feeling, and I think most of us do, that humankind has this power of intellectual investigation. That we have the ability to seek out truth and find it, whatever that means. <laughs> and that Abdul Baha'i states that the greatest virtue of which is scientific enlightenment. That we can look into the 
secrets of creation and the acquisition of higher knowledge. That the betterment of the human race is only achieved through the spirit, through the investigation into the spirit and mysteries of God. That it is our intellectual capacity that enables us to draw these forth. And that these themselves have to be applied to the domain of religion. Now, many people believe they actually have done so. But I would suggest there is a great, great difference between investigating something to prove that it's false and investigating something to see whether or not it is true. One begins with a decision that it is false and then looks for problems in order to refute it. The other one is trying to understand it on its own terms and see whether or not it is actually true. And this is actually what the Baha'i Faith is calling for. And if the possibility is never entertained, then the actual investigation has never occurred. We cannot come at a religion, even if it's Buddhism, and say, okay, well, I know without a doubt and refuse to consider anything other than the world is purely material and physical, and then actually go investigate Buddhism with the belief that it can't possibly be true, and then hunt for problems. This would not be an investigation, this would be a polemic, a war against another ideology. As it says in the, the book of Proverbs, Before a downfall the heart is haughty, but humility comes before honor. To answer before listening, that is folly and shame. I love this quote from the book of Proverbs, from the Jewish scriptures, because it says, To answer before listening, that is a folly and a shame. Now, not only is it wrong and an error, but it's shameful to approach some claim, some belief system, and actually judge it before you have actually heard it. Which means to have never have actually considered it, that it is shameful. Why is it shameful? I would suggest because in the quote we were just reading from Abdu'l Baha, one of the most exquisite gems of humankind, in fact, one of the things that truly defines us, is our ability to use our intellect and to actually investigate things without prejudice, and to actually take that God-given gift and put it aside, or if you will, even to take that evolutionary given gift and to put it aside and refuse to utilize it in the investigation of religion or in the investigation of spirituality is shameful. This is why Abdu'l Baha says the following. God has created man and endowed him with the power of reason, whereby he may arrive at valid conclusions. Therefore, man must endeavor in all things to investigate the fundamental reality. If he does not independently investigate, he has failed to utilize the talent God has bestowed upon him. So in this quote, as we were just saying, Abdu'l-Bah says, if he does not independently investigate, it, investigate, he has failed to utilize the talent God has bestowed upon him. Any individual who will not use a rational investigation of something has taken a part of what it is to be human and put it aside. And if we, again, I would suggest, if we immediately begin an investigation from the position that it is false, as opposed to actually seeing if it could be false or could be true, we have not investigated and then have placed aside this most precious gift. The primary, the most urgent requirement is the promotion of education. It is inconceivable that any nation should achieve prosperity and success unless this paramount, this fundamental concern is carried forward. The principal reason for the decline and fall of people is ignorance. The publication of high thoughts is the dynamic power in the arteries of life. It is the very soul of the world. Thoughts are a boundless sea and the effects and varying conditions of existence are as the separate forms and individual limits of the waves. Not until the, soil, the sea boils up will the waves rise and scatter their pearls of knowledge on the shore of life. Thou brother art thy thought alone, the rest is the only thew and bone. 
Public opinion must be directed toward whatever is worthy of this day. And this is impossible except through the use of adequate arguments and the adducing of clear, comprehensive, and conclusive proofs. In this quote from The Secret of Divine Civilization, Abdu'l-Baha states that it is inconceivable that any nation could achieve prosperity and success, right, unless this paramount fundamental concern is carried forward, and that the principal reason for the decline and fall of peoples is ignorance. It is our unwillingness to investigate and our willingness to close our eyes to potential truths and leave this precious gift of God latent within us, our ability to investigate and allow it to remain fallow. He even states in this quote that the publication of high thoughts is the very soul of the world. Abdu'l-Baha then quotes a poetic phrase, Thou brother art thy thought alone, the rest is only few and bone. And then states that it is impossible to direct public opinion except through the use of adequate arguments and the adducing of clear, comprehensive, and conclusive proofs. Why does he quote this passage of poetry? It's because he's saying, if you were to truly estimate the nature of what you are as a human being, yes, you have a physical body, you have ligaments, you have arteries, and you have bone. Yet what you really are, what really defines humankind, is our ability to manifest the qualities and the virtues of God. Justice, compassion, honesty, mercy. Yet, we are our thought alone because that is through which even those are directed. Through choice. Through our own, the exercise of our own free will. And that if we are to put aside this very soul of the world, the publication of high thoughts, to put aside this God-given gift, we are actually choosing actively to be nothing more than a physical temple, to be nothing more really than an animal. Consider the people and nations of the earth today and observe the same tenacious allegiance to ancestral belief. He whose father was a Zoroastrian is a Zoroastrian. He whose father was a Buddhist remains a Buddhist. The son of a Muslim continues a Muslim and so on throughout. Why is this? because they are slaves and captives of mere imitation. They have not investigated the reality of religion and arrived at its fundamental and conclusions. The Jew, for instance, has not proved the validity of Moses by investigating reality. He is a Jew because his father was a Jew. He imitates the forms and beliefs of his fathers and ancestors. There is no thought or mention of reality. And so is it with the other peoples of religion. This is the purpose of our statement, that they worship the dawning point, rather than the sun of reality itself. There is no doubt that very often the individual who was raised within a Christian household becomes a Christian. That raised in a Jewish family ends up being Jewish. Zoroastrian becomes a Zoroastrian. And this is a beautiful thing if, in fact, that choice of faith is done in accordance with the independent investigation of reality. If that individual has sought to understand the beauty of the tradition in which they have actually grown up and seeks independently for themselves to see whether or not it is true. Um, at the same time, in this first quote, Abdu'l-Baha talks about how what what he means by individuals worshipping the dawning point rather than the light itself is this imitation of one's forefathers. This imitation or becoming a captive of a very prior tradition. Rather than seeking out and proving the validity and the reality of that tradition for oneself and adopting it upon the basis of exploration and investigation. In this sense, one ends up actually merely investigating their own tradition, or worse, we would put, um, when an individual actually simply chooses the faith of their culture. There has been no investigation of the essential underlying basis of reality. One whose father was a Jew invariably proved to be a Jew, 
a Muslim was born of a Muslim. A Buddhist was a Buddhist because of the faith of his father before him, and so on. In brief, religion was a heritage descending from father to son, ancestry to posterity, without investigation of the fundamental reality. Consequently, all religionists were veiled, obscured, and at variance. In this quote, Abdu'l-Bahá explains that this is actually how the veiling and obscuring of the original intent of religion comes about, that this is its primary vehicle. Because one grows up, for example, within the Christian faith, and hears of the fundamental creeds and doctrines, and instead of actually asking, well, are these actually what the New Testament taught? Is this truly what actually Jesus meant, or what Paul meant, or what Peter meant? They take this on as the standard filter through which they see the revelation of Jesus Christ in the New Testament. The same could be, for example, within the Islamic world. One grows up and they are taught that this is what Islam means, this is what the Quran says. And instead of investigating reality for themselves, they follow mere imitation and become captives of this tradition, and have not for themselves actually sought out the true beauty and wonder of, for example, the message of the Quran. Then in a sense, there comes, as we will return to this in the future, there comes this insistence that this is what the Quran says, this is what Islam says. But in reality, in my understanding from the writings of Abdul Baha and the central figures of the Baha'i Faith, it is merely the repetition of the creeds, doctrine, doctrines, and dogmas of the tradition that they have grown up within. Shall man, gifted with the power of reason, unthinkingly follow and adhere to dogma, creeds, and hereditary beliefs which will not bear the analysis of reason in this century of effulgent reality? Unquestionably this will not satisfy men of science, for when they find a premise or conclusion contrary to present standards of proof and without real foundation, they reject that which has been formally accepted as standard and correct, and move forward from new foundations." In this quote, Abu Baha, and I want to make this clear, is not actually criticizing the acceptance of actual traditions or creeds or dogmas. Rather, it is the unthinking acceptance. If I, for example, take on the research program, say, of Einsteinian physics, and I have done so by, so by actually investigating what it has to say, and seeing that it is true, when I adopt it, I adopt it as a truth that has actually been acquired through intellectual investigation. Very different when I actually just hear what is said and then parrot it back to another group of people. This would be becoming a captive of mere imitation. And I think that when we actually look at this, the, the Abdu'l-Bahá is asking that these dogmas and creeds and hereditary beliefs bear the analysis of reason. And then when someone actually encounters this and realizes through exploration, through the duty of investigation and the duty of inquiry, finds that they do not bear up to the analysis of reason, then it is in accordance with the intellectual honesty of an individual to put those creeds aside. Um, and again, we've just seen that actually Abdu'l-Bahá says that this is how, if you will, the momentum of dogmas and creeds begin to obscure the original intent and purpose of a divine revelation from God to humankind. The first teaching of Baha'u'llah is the investigation of re reality. Man must seek reality himself, forsaking imitations and adherence to mere hereditary forms. As the nations of the world are following imitations in lieu of truth, and as imitations are many and various, differences of belief have been productive of strife and warfare. So long as these imitations remain, the oneness of the world of humanity is impossible. Therefore, we must investigate reality in order that by its light, the clouds and darkness may be dispelled. Reality is one reality. It does not admit multiplicity or division. If the nations of the world investigate reality, they will agree and become united.
Now, in this quote, Abdu'l-Baha is saying that the imitations are many and various. And this is in some sense an undeniable fact when we actually look, if you will, at the many and various sects and denominations within the day different faith communities. That they actually have very different perspectives on, for example, what the Buddha taught, or what Hinduism really means, or what Christianity really stands for, what the New Testament is truly attempting to express. So they are many and various. And it's this that actually Abdu'l-Wah is saying is actually the clouds that are actually truly veiling or obscuring the divine light. And the question is, how do we actually move through them? The following quote is also from the Promulgation of Universal Peace. And what we're going to do is actually uh, take it in chunks, as we have before, and look at how the different parts of it hang together. In divine questions, we must not depend entirely upon the heritage of tradition and form former human experience. Nay, rather, we must exercise reason, analyze and logically examine the facts presented, so that confidence will be inspired and faith attained. Then, and then only, the reality of things will be revealed to us. Man should continue both these lines of research and investigation, so that all the human virtues, outer and inner, may become possible. The attainment of these virtues, both material and ideal, is conditioned upon intelligent investigation of reality, by which investigation the sublimity of man and his intellectual progress is accomplished. Forms must be set aside and renounced. Reality must be sought. We must discover for ourselves where and what reality is. In religious beliefs, nations and peoples today are imitators of ancestors and forefathers. If a man's father was a Christian, he himself is a Christian. A Buddhist is the son of a Buddhist, a Zoroastrian of a Zoroastrian. A Gentile or an idolater follows the religious footsteps of his father and ancestry. This is absolute imitation. The requirement in this day is that man must independently and impartially investigate every form of reality. So in the first part of this quote, Abdu'l-Baha is saying that actually both within the material realm, the physical sciences, and the ideal realm, the realm of the inner world, um, that one actually must truly seek out investigation, which is the sublimity of man. That we actually have to do all we can, and we all have our own limitations, but to do all that we can to actually seek out truth within the natural world and within our own hearts, our souls, and our minds. This is then paralleled to the investigation of religion itself. We actually have to be willing to put aside our own background, our own biases, and our own prior beliefs to actually truly investigate these different religions, and to see whether or not they are true. And if we see truth within one faith, and we see that same light shining in another faith, we actually have to bow and ascend to it. This is why the next paragraph begins the great question appertaining to humanity is religion. The great question appertaining to humanity is religion. The first condition is that man must intelligently investigate its foundations. The second condition is that he must admit and acknowledge the oneness of the world of humanity. By this means the attainment of true fellowship among mankind is assured, and the alienation of races and individuals is prevented. Religion is one of the most powerful forces in human society. Billions of people throughout the world adhere to some faith tradition. And even outside of the traditional faith traditions, the beliefs, metaphysical, spiritual, no matter what they are, are really what actually moves society along. And they don't merely move the individuals, they actually move whole cultures. Entire cultures are actually, if you will, underpinned or undergirded by these belief systems. So to look out at the world and to try to understand it 
It is actually a pipe dream if we do not seek to understand what is in the hearts and minds of the people that make up the cultures that we are studying. This is how my own study of comparative religion began. I wanted to understand my world. I wanted to understand politics and history and sociology. I also wanted to understand how people felt, what they thought about their world, how they saw themselves and their culture. And I realized very early on that actually in order to do so, I would actually have to study the classical traditions that undergird these societies. And here in this passage, in this whole section, Abdu'l-Baha is saying that we actually intelligently investigate their foundations. What actually is the foundation of these faiths? Naturally, the foundations of these faiths are their actual scriptures. Yes, it is important to know how they have interacted upon the plane of history. It's important to know how people have seen them and how great minds have actually interacted with these texts. Yet the foundations of them first are their scriptures, and I would say the purport and intent of the scriptures. The second condition, admit and acknowledge the oneness of the world of humanity. Why I, for myself, this was really important is because I wanted to be able to sit with anyone from anywhere and be able to know something of their tradition and their understanding of their scriptures to see what lay within the heart of these individuals. And I actually grant this also to agnosticism, atheism, new age traditions, that I want to know how they think and how they feel. Because without this, I am somewhat blinded to the world in which I live. Here it says we must acknowledge the oneness of the world of humanity. And I think there's a deeper aspect that's actually running through this, which is that we have to realize that if there is a divine being, if there is a God, to me, and even in my younger years, that divine being would have actually communicated to all of humankind, would not have left many of his children without guidance. And to see, well, maybe, even if it's just a baby, potentially in other cultures, the divine mind and the divine will has expressed itself in ways that were, as we've seen, tailored to these societies at the level they're at. And if such is the case, potentially they might look quite different than we would expect. But inside that lamp, we would say, find the same light. Inside the frame of that stranger mirror, if you will, we would see the same reflection of the sun. We now begin a section I call Secularism, Rationality, and Religion. Unity and Truth Tracking. Irreligion has conquered religion. The cause of the chaotic condition lies in the differences among the religions and finds its origin in the animosity and hatred existing between sects and denominations. Owing to strife and contention among themselves, the religions are being weakened and vanquished. If a commander is at variance with his army in the execution of military tactics, there is no doubt he will be defeated by the enemy. Today the religions are at a variance. Enmity, strife, and recrimination prevail among them. They refuse to associate, nay, rather, if necessary, they shed each other's blood. I love this quote because Abdu'l-Baha is very clear. He's very clear in that he actually places the burden of responsibility for the waning of people's love for that which is religious upon the shoulders of religious people. That the animosity comes from the differences between the religions themselves. And further, that is the animosity and hatred existing between sects and denominations. It's important because no one who looks at history and sees many of the divisions that have actually occurred, for example, between Christianity and Islam, between Buddhism and Hinduism, between even Confucianism and Hinduism, no individual that sees these wars, these battles, these contentions, this strife, can honestly, I believe, fail to actually have sorrow well up in their heart. Even anger at the betrayal of, if you will, the moral sphere and covenants of peace that humankind should have, that are actually enjoined by these traditions. And I think in some sense, at least for me, how much worse when we actually look at an individual tradition 
something like Christianity, and we see all these sects and denominations, again, like Sunni and Shia, for example, who have actually gone to war and killed each other because of a difference of understanding and interpretation of a holy book. This is something that I think individuals of any background have to come really to terms with and empathize with how really truly depressing this is, that you can have the same holy book, love the same divine manifestation of God, the expression of his will, be it in the temple of the Prophet Muhammad, in the temple of the Buddha, or the temple of Jesus Christ, and then really come to blows and even murder, even if just pure anger and contention and hatred between individuals that actually love the same tradition. Imitation destroys the foundation of religion, extinguishes the spirituality of the human world, transforms heavenly illumination into darkness, and deprives man of the knowledge of God. It is the cause of the victory of materialism and infidelity over religion. It is the denial of divinity and the law of revelation. It refuses prophethood and rejects the kingdom of God. When materialists subject imitations to the intellectual analysis of reason, they find them to be mere superstitions. Therefore, they deny religion. It's so beautiful here because once again, Abdu'l-Baha is placing the burden of responsibility for why individuals of an atheistic, materialistic background reject religion upon the adherence of religion themselves. In a sense, there is a sort of, what do you expect? You have actually taken something that you have not investigated, uh, can't explain or express to someone else, and you're offering it to them to accept. They look at it, and if it actually appears to be foolishness, then it is just for them to look at it under the analysis of, of reason and actually to deny it. This is very, very important. We see within the Baha'i Faith that this is actually why we have to produce arguments and intelligent expressions of religion to humankind so they can find solace not merely in their heart, but also within their mind. It's why um, we see that we're to produce arguments and remove the apprehensions of people. Uh, please see the actual deepening on knowledge and learning uh, on this site. Now, we see that actually this imitation and this offering of superstition as truth, quote, deprives man of the knowledge of God. That we actually have to be willing to truly do our best to understand something, to offer it as a gift to a king. This is an analogy that's used within the Baha'i writings, to it, offer it as a priceless gift to a king. But when you offer a priceless gift to a king, you, you do your best to polish it, <laughs> to, uh, to see its beauty for yourself and to refine it for when you hand it to the king or the queen. Now, there are in many traditions individuals who will say, for example, well, you just have to have faith. And in my understanding of the Baha'i writings, this is actually not what we're asking to do, nor is it the meaning of faith that we find either within the Baha'i writings, and I would actually argue, nor within the Christian scriptures or the Jewish scriptures. And there's an inherent problem here because if we actually say to someone, well, you just have to have faith, and say I'm saying this from a Christian tradition, and I say you just have, have to have faith, what if the individual responds, I do have faith, I have faith in Krishna. Because then, if you merely have to have faith, then you can have faith, for example, in the Buddha. You can have faith in the Prophet Muhammad. You can have faith in Noah. You can have faith in Zoroaster. There has to be a way that we can separate between these, if any of them are true. And it has to be able, in my belief, in my understanding of the Baha'i writings, to actually solace the heart and the mind of humankind. Now, these forms and rituals differ in the various churches and amongst the different sects and even contradict one another, giving rise to discord, hatred, and disunion. The outcome of all this dissension is the belief of many cultured men that religion and science are contradictory terms, that religion needs no powers of reflection, 
and should in no wise be regulated by science, but must of necessity be opposed, the one to the other. The unfortunate effect of this is that science has drifted apart from religion, and religion has become a mere blind and more or less apathetic following of the precepts of certain religious teachers, who insist on their own favorite dogmas being accepted, even when they are contrary to science. This is foolishness, for it is quite evident that science is the light, and, being so, Religion, truly so-called, does not oppose knowledge. Again, the second half of this quote I find so beautiful because it's saying that the outcome of all this dissension is that cultured men, individuals within society who are trying to use their mind and their heart, find that religion and science are contradictory. And it's really important here because it says that religion needs no powers of reflection. And this is something we're about to go into, is that the question that, well, if you're going to look at science, do you or do you not need to look at it rationally? And if rationally, does not it demand investigation? Does not it demand actually the sacrifice any investigative process actually demands? <laughs> this brings us here to the question of syncretism. And it is generally seen as the combination of different forms of belief or practice. And it's interesting because syncretism itself is actually always expressed in the pejorative, meaning to call, for example, a tradition uh, syncretistic is actually to say something about its, if you will, falsity, or that it is a mere patchwork, almost like a Frankenstein, where you're taking different beliefs and you're just sort of smashing them together or sewing them together to create something that never should have been. And I don't think this is the only meaning that we can actually have of syncretism. An example often given is the Greco-Roman world, where a Greek or a Roman encounters someone, say, from the Near East, and they see that they have a god, and this god actually has many of the attributes of their god. So suddenly they say, well, you know, our god is your god, and your god is our god. And it's seen as if it's, if you will, ignoring many of the differences, and once again, bringing these different traditions together in a way they never should have, right? Really, in a sense, putting a round peg into a square hole. I think what's important to actually consider here is... There's a difference between is something syncretistic or is it addressing prior truth claims? What if a movement, even in the case of the Greco-Roman world, is not actually stating, well, let's ignore the actual differences. Let's just completely ignore them and just crush them together because there are some sort of vague similarities, but is rather saying, well, wait a minute. Now let's actually take a look at your tradition and see really beyond, if you will, the idols themselves or the external outward forms, if really there is a heritage that we are both trying to communicate, where there is some common origin lying behind the scenes, and that we may be simply making differences that do not need to be stressed, or even in some cases, acknowledged. It's important to look at this. I myself have had individuals say to me that actually the Baha'i faith is a, a mere syncretism. And it is expressed in the sense that, like I said, you're taking things that should never be together and you're just sort of slapping them all together. They never really should be. Yet this is something that in the tradition of world religion could actually be accused of actually the vast majority of faiths. And that's something I actually want to look at now. In this case, we're going to start with Islam, and I want to read two quotes from the Qur'an. Those who believe in the Qur'an and those who follow the Jewish scriptures, and the Christians and the Sabians, any who believe in Allah and the last day and work righteousness shall have their reward with their Lord. On them shall be no fear, nor shall they grieve. Say, O people of the book, ye have no ground to stand upon unless ye stand fast by the law, Torah, the gospel, and all the revelation that has come to you from your Lord. It is the revelation that cometh to thee 
from thy Lord, that increaseth in most of them their obstinate rebellion and blasphemy. But sorrow thou not over these people without faith. Those who believe in the Quran, those who follow the Jewish scriptures and the Sabians and the Christians, any who believe in Allah and the last day and work righteousness, on them shall be no fear, nor shall they grieve. Syncretism is an accusation that has been thrown at Islam traditionally. In these two passages of the Quran, it's stating those who believe within the Jewish scriptures, the Quran, the Christians, and the Sabians, a very enigmatic reference, um, and any of those who believe in the last day and work righteousness. There's another passage of the Quran where it says, those who believe in God and in the last day, and that he hath sent prophets. Now, in a sense, why isn't this a syncretism between Judaism, Christianity, Sabianism, and for example, let's say Zoroastrianism. Is it actually syncretism, or is it in fact simply claiming that these were true prior expressions, which have a, if you will, an original source that is divine, and that has been expressed in different ways throughout history, in a progressive chain of messengers? Which one? Syncretism or addressing prior truth claims and the unity of religion. Christianity. Equally with Christianity, it has been claimed and could be claimed that on the surface this is a syncretic faith. Why would we say this? Uh, for one, because it actually addresses the claims of Ezekiel, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Moses, Noah, Abraham, there is a whole series of traditions that actually exist before Jesus Christ shows up. But in addition to this, and I'm just offering this for consideration, we see terms that are used within the Greek New Testament, not a Hebrew work, that actually come directly from Greek philosophy. For example, the Stoic concept of the Logos, a divine principle that lies beyond the world that is in some sense both the ground of what is true and what is good. Equally so within the New Testament, we see, for example, three figures show up at the cradle of Jesus Christ. The three magi, commonly referred to as the three wise men. These individuals, it seems, are clearly, if one looks into it, Zoroastrian priests. The magi themselves are an expression of Zoroastrianism, and then when we turn to Christianity, we see a series of doctrines which seem particularly Zoroastrian. <laughs> um, we see this idea of Satan, this ultimate dark force that is pulling against humankind towards that which is evil. But this, if you look into Zoroastrianism, which predates the Christian religion, looks like Ahriman or Angramanyu, this dark force that is actually tempting humankind. Equally as well, we find within the Buddhist scriptures the tempting of the Buddha by Mara the Destroyer, one who actually comes to the Buddha right when he is about to express his understanding of the Dharma and offers him power, offers him riches, so that he will not express the Dharma to the world. A very similar theme that which we actually find in the testing of Jesus Christ in the New Testament by Satan. And in both of these cases, Zoroastrianism and Buddhism both predate Christianity. Now the question is, is Christianity taking a syncretic form by attaching itself to Judaism, and then taking notions from Zoroastrianism into itself, even using a couple Zoroastrian players in the birth narrative of Jesus Christ? Is it actually bringing in themes from Buddhism, or is this actually archetypal motifs and expressions of prior truth claims, if you will, if you will, trails of crumbs that one could actually follow and find beauty elsewhere, the same light within different lamps? And again, from my own perspective, this is not a Stoic, Zoroastrian, Jewish syncretism. It is actually the revelation of God to humankind addressing many of these issues and trying to bring them into a synthesis 
to educate humankind, to raise them up to a new level where they can become one community and carry forward an ever advancing civilization. What about Judaism? <laughs> um, this is the same thing again. It's important to note, and we've seen this uh, <clears throat> previously, that the Bible itself, the Tanakh in this example, what Christians call the Old Testament, is actually a series of books. It's not one book. It's dozens of them strung together. Is this syncretism? Is really someone guilty of just taking Isaiah and taking Ezekiel and taking the book of Jeremiah and, and grabbing Exodus and putting it together with Proverbs and Psalms. Is this syncretic or, or is this actually because these are expressions of the divine will through time to humankind in an ever-expanding and unveiling of the divine friend? Equally so in this case, because I, again, I will stress one thing, because any individual, for example, who historically had actually followed Abraham upon, if you will, walking out into Sinai with Moses and receiving all these laws, would have had this belief that, well, wait a minute, that's, that's not the religion of my father Abraham. These are different teachings. Any, just like uh, previously said, any individual who was Jewish and encountered Christianity did not seem to, if you will, gel or jive with what they had expected and what they had traditionally known. It's also important to note that not only is the Old Testament, sorry, the Tanakh, the Hebrew Bible, a threaded series of books that have been brought together, it also addresses themes and motifs and religious questions and actual sacred stories from the Near East, much of which we only were able to uncover within the 19th and 20th century. For example, in the Epic of Gilgamesh, you find the story of Utnapishtim, where actually it uncannily is actually the same as the story of Noah. Now, I would argue, and may in the future, that actually when one looks at the story of Utnapishtim and the story of Noah and Noah's Ark, that this is actually addressing this story. It is addressing this theme or motif, just like the concept of the Logos in the New Testament is actually addressing a Greek philosophical notion. And actually pairing it, if you will, with a Jewish concept of divine wisdom, which, if anyone's interested, can be found in the Book of Wisdom, in the Apocrypha, or in Chapter 8 of the Book of Proverbs. The question here is, is this once again a syncretism, or is it unifying a series of beliefs, if you will, bringing them back to their original intent and purpose, or using them to communicate a message, and at the same time healing the human consciousness? Or is it merely co-opting and syncretizing? Buddhist syncretism. There is no doubt in anyone's mind who actually reads the original Buddhist writings that Buddhism is taking figures from the Vedic pantheon, pulling them into the sutras of the Buddha, and treating them in a very innovative way. That you find therein Vayu, Agni, Varuna, Indra, <laughs> the main gods from the Hindu pantheon, but they take on a different facet or a different flavor. You also have the doctrine of samsara pulled directly into Buddhism. In some sense, you have, I don't know if this is always obvious to people, but holy Upanishadic thoughts, meaning concepts from Vedantic philosophy based upon the works called the Upanishads. They suddenly appear within Buddhism but they seem to be adjusted. They seem to be, if you will, opened up. And sometimes they seem to directly contradict the expressions of the Upanishads and the Vedas. Now, is this a syncretism? Is this an individual uh, that we refer to as the Buddha taking his own beliefs, grabbing some issues from the Vedas, uh, from the Brahmanas, from the Upanishads, and just sort of mashing them together in a sort of Frankenstein way? Or once again, is this a diagnosis, a healing, a unifying, and a cleaning? Um, obviously for myself, 
I believe, in each of these cases. It is the divine physician, a term used for the Baha'i manifestation of God, going into a culture, seeing the psychological, spiritual, and cultural challenges that are facing that culture, and using, if you will, the material of that culture to carry them forward and instilling it with a new wine, a new fragrance, a new spirit. If you will, a motif used within the Baha'i writings, taking the trees at the end of a winter and giving them new foliage. Hindu syncretism. Uh, the following are quotes from the Veda itself and from the Bhagavad Gita, and I will read them this time. They call him Indra Mitra Varuna, Agni, and he is heavenly, nobly winged Garutman. To what is one, sages give many a title. They call it Agni, Yama, Matarisan. This is a quote that's often used from the Rig Veda to point this out. That, in a sense, there are these different names for the Divine One that are attempts to express, if you will, the properties and qualities of the Divine Being itself. This is like, if you will, trying to even describe a car <laughs> where you're expressing its color, its shape, its form, and you're using all these different adjectives, all these different predicates to describe this one thing. It's not that each and any one of these is the whole thing. The car isn't redness, if you will. The car isn't its motor. The car isn't its drive shaft. But you're trying to describe through all these predicates, all these adjectives, the wholeness of what it is, and these, in a sense, being divine, get personified. Uh, and again, we will look at this in the future, but I would argue, and many already have, that Hinduism is not a polytheistic faith. But here we find another quote, and then the second quote is from the Bhagavad Gita. And again, pardon my pronunciation. <laughs> I am the Self, O Gudakesha, seated in the heart of all creatures. I am the beginning, the middle, and the end of all beings. Of the Adityas, I am Vishnu. Of lights, I am the radiant sun. I am Marichi of the Maruts, and among the stars, I am the moon. Of the Vedas, I am the Samaveda. Of the demigods, I am Indra. Of the senses, I am the mind. And in living beings, I am the living force. Of all the Rudras, I am Lord Shiva. Of the Yakshas and the Raksasas, I am the Lord of Wealth. Of the Vasus I am fire, Agni, and of the mountains I am Meru. Of the priests, O Arjuna, know me to be the chief, Biraspati, the lord of devotion. Of the generals I am Skanda, the lord of war, and of the bodies of water I am the ocean. Of the great sages I am Brigu, of vibrations I am the transcendental Om. Of sacrifices I am the chanting of the holy names, and of immovable things. I am the Himalayas. There are several passages like this within the Gita, and this passage is actually quite a bit longer, and this is from chapter 10 of the Gita, where Krishna, in, in expressing himself to Arjuna, one of the other characters in the Bhagavad Gita, a principal Hindu devotional text, he explains himself to be the height of each of these different classes of being. The one power, divine power, the one beauty, the one love that is actually behind each of these manifestations. And of course, in this case, he even says of the mountains, he is Meru, of the, of the, of the mountain ranges, he is the Himalayas, meaning of all things, he is the apex. Now, when one looks at this, is this actually a brushing aside of the differences? For example, between Shiva and Varuna, is it trying to, if you will, Frankenstein them together and make them syncretic? Or is it actually coming out and saying, there is a divine spark here. These are the different attributes of my being. This is the different predicates one could actually apply to who I am. This is actually how individuals have attempted to communicate me to mankind at their level through a diagnosis and a remedy. Which one of these is it? Is it actually syncretism or is it unification? Should we, in fact, be anti-syncretic 
Is it simply a policy that when we see people taking divergent things and bringing them together, that we should naturally oppose it? Isn't that a truth claim itself? It's interesting, this idea of syncretism, because I think we also find that we can make the claim against atheistic materialism. Is it syncretic? This may come across as a very strange notion, and it is one that we will look at in depth uh, in the future on this site. Can we rationally maintain the ideas, the platonic ideas, of the good, the true, and the beautiful, and at the same time claiming that we are living in a world of pure material matter? Can we say that human life itself has no purpose and no goal, no end to which it is supposed to express itself, and still claim that there are moral properties? That one is responsible, the term I use is beholden, to become an ethical being. But even barring an ethical being, is there a responsibility and a duty for humankind to actually seek knowledge, even to seek truth, to explore it? Can the notion of something being true, which sounds like a completely intangible property, actually even be kept within the worldview of atheistic materialism? These are at times complicated questions, and at times I think merely contemplated, or sorry, complicated, because of the sophisticated attempts to answer them. I would ask that we put this on pause, but to consider for yourself, is atheistic materialism itself a syncretism of a metaphysics of materialism, and at the same time, a grabbing of a tradition of humankind, of culturation, of cultured minds, of the goals of being a noble being and of actually being a truth-seeking mind and trying to mash them together. For are there actually moral properties? Or is there in fact not a merely practical benefit to being rational, but is there an innate value hierarchy within these? Because if it is mere pragmatism, what if I don't find it useful to my ends? Again, I only throw this out there for, for your consideration, and this will be a topic we're going to go through quite in depth in the future. Empathy with oddity and incredulity. Despite all these sort of syncretistic uh, questions, I, I do empathize. I do truly empathize uh, with the Muslim or with the Jew or with the Christian or the Buddhist or the Hindu, when they look at their faith, uh, less so for some, but when they look at their faith, and they look at other faiths across the road, if you will, and they see these radical differences, what they perceive to be radical differences, between their faith and another philosophical religious tradition. I have empathy, actually, for someone who is actually studying comparative religion. Why? That's, that's actually where I came from. I myself may have been raised within a Catholic household, may have attended a Catholic church, yet at the same time, when I began to study uh, the world's religions, no doubt there were times where I was like, wow, these things are quite a bit different. At the same time, and we'll go into this more deeply, I thought there might be an underlying unity, which led me first to look deeper, and secondly, to be willing to listen to a Baha'i position. But it's not only myself. I offer to you a quote uh, from the Work One Common Faith, which was published by the World Center. The objection most commonly raised against the foregoing conception of religion is the assertion that the differences among the revealed faiths are so fundamental that to present them as stages or aspects of one unified system of truth does violence to the facts. Given the confusion surrounding the nature of religion, the reaction is understandable. Chiefly, however, such an objection offers Baha'is an invitation to set the principles reviewed here more explicitly in the evolutionary context provided in Baha'u'llah's writings. I actually use this quote uh, constantly <laughs> within talks or deepenings that I actually give. Um, the reason why is because, first of all, this passage actually acknowledges one that this is one of the objections most commonly raised. What? 
The differences are so fundamental that to present them as stages or aspects of one unified system of truth, here, and I want to focus on this quote, does violence to the facts. It seems to go fundamentally against <laughs> the grain of what these different traditions are saying. Why I love it so much is because of the next statement. Given the confusion, the reaction is understandable. So for myself, as a Baha'i, when I encounter someone who, upon hearing the notion of the unity of religion, sees this as bizarre, it's understandable. I, I, I can empathize very much with this, especially, again, because I myself, coming from a background in the study of religion, found it very objectionable. And when would have easily said, well, this appears in many ways to do violence to the facts. That, however, should be seen as what? This work uh, from One Common Faith, which I really seriously <laughs> propose everybody read many times, <laughs> um, it should be seen as an invitation. So think for yourself, if you are a Baha'i watching this, and someone actually comes up to you and you share your idea of the concept of progressive revelation, the unity of religion as expressed by Baha'u'llah, Abdul Baha, the Bab, Shoghi Effendi, when this is actually expressed and they say, that's absurd, that is actually a ridiculous notion, this should be understandable. Do your best to empathize with it and then seek if you will, to walk hand in hand with that individual, to explore with them, to accompany them on their investigation of the unity of religion. And if you don't know the answer, or if you don't understand something, seek out someone who might. Even yourself acknowledge that in cases where you, if you don't understand it, say you don't understand, but be willing to look. Your questions are not my questions, and my questions are not your questions. It is absolutely impossible that you would actually in, be in a state where you could answer any possible question of any individual. Because some people have questions you've never even thought of. And when it comes to the unity of religion, someone who's actually coming from a Jewish background or from a Hindu background may have questions about the divergence, say, between Hinduism and Islam, or Christianity and even Judaism, that you've never ever heard of. Understand it, empathize with it, and seek. The second passage here is from Shoghi Effendi. True, the minds of many are turned away from all that sounds religious, but it is only because they are ill-advised as to the meaning of true religion. And it is just that mission that de devolves upon us to give a new viewpoint, to revive fresh hopes, and to guide by the sacred utterances the thoughts and actions of mankind. This passage from The Guardian is, again, absolutely exquisite. It is not because of some evil, <laughs> some ignorance, in the sense of willful ignorance, that has often generated this, if you will, animosity towards religion. It's, he says that have turned away from all that sounds religious. But why? They're ill-advised as to the meaning. We looked at above that actually, given the actual contention, the animosity that has actually been generated, and often the hatred that actually exists among the various world religions and among the, if you will, the sects and denominations of individual religions, it doesn't seem strange that someone would actually feel hesitant towards these faiths. Equally, we saw above the statement that often what is handed to someone is a superstition an uninvestigated creed or dogma that is presented as the truth of that religion, and it says, and when they do not bear the analysis of reason, Abdu'l Baha says, they reject it. And we are to empathize with this too. We're also to empathize, as we just read, with the idea of doing violence to the facts when we present them as one unified whole, or one aspects, or sorry, different aspects of one unified truth. So when it comes to this, when we meet individuals that find religion unpalatable, what are we to do? See it as an invitation. <laughs> Even in here it says, it is just that mission that devolves upon us. To give what? A fresh viewpoint. Revive fresh hopes. 
and guide. So once more, if you're sharing with a friend and they actually see religion as just, forgive me, stupidity and divisive, try for a moment to understand where that's coming from, to empathize with it, and then seek to give a new viewpoint, to offer the truth that you see, and to try to revive fresh hopes for the future of humankind in a cause that will unify them. The next quote is actually a peculiar one in the context. It's actually from Galileo Galilei in the dialogue concerning the two chief world systems. This is actually the work wherein Galileo updates and defends the Copernican vision of what? The sun being at the center of the solar system and the planets orbiting around it, as opposed to the sun being at the center, sorry, the earth being at the center, and the sun, the moon, and all the planets revolving around it. I cannot sufficiently admire the eminence of those men's wits that have received and held it to be true, and with the sprightliness of their judgments offered such violence to their own senses, as that they have been able to prefer that which their reason dictated to them to that which sensible experiments represented most manifestly to the contrary. I cannot find any bounds for my admiration, how that reason was able in Aristarchus and Copernicus to commit such a rape on their senses, as in despite thereof to make herself mistress of their credulity. I actually love this quote uh, by Galileo, because he is praising those wits, <laughs> uh, those minds that received and held to be true, quote, and done such violence to their own senses that they prefer that which is their reason dictated to them to that which sensible experiments represented most manifestly to the contrary. Why is he actually saying this? The reason why, when you look into the history of science, is that when Copernicus and then Galileo were presenting this idea of the sun being at the center and the planets orbiting around it, it did violence to the senses. It appeared to do violence to the facts. Why? Because the Earth is spinning at an unimaginable speed and no one's flying off. Not only is it spinning at an unimaginable speed in people of that day, it is whirling around the solar system at an unfathomable speed. And yet here we are resting peacefully upon its surface. This is made all the more, if you will, um, visceral, because at the time there wasn't a physics, which we would have to wait for Newton, there was not a physics to explain how this could be possible. They believed in an Aristotelian physics, where things found their natural place and went to the center. That's why rocks fell towards the Earth. That's what kept us on the Earth, because we were closest to the center, on the surface, if you will, of the center. And it's important to note that silence, sorry, silence, science often does seem to do violence to our senses. That which is true does not always actually accord with what the outside forms seem to be telling us, if you will. The example given here is from Galileo, which is the rotating Earth. The fact that it's whipping around the Earth in a massive orbit. But we could add to the emptiness of solid objects that things can have particle and wave-like characteristics. We can, if we look at this, and there are many examples within the sciences that there is some, as we will see, common unity to something like helium and gold. The question isn't if it does violence to our senses, if it does violence to our facts. Many truths do. The question is, do we stop there? Do we investigate to see if, in spite of something doing, seeming to do violence to the facts or doing violence to our senses, is it true? And if it is a truth claim, and it is important, which religion is, if it is possible they are unified, are we willing to put in the time to explore that idea? 
I think this is important too because, of course, as we saw above, individuals can, being raised within a Jewish household, if you will, simply fall into being Jewish. Someone being a Christian is just either merely culturally a Christian, because it's connected to their heritage, but at the same time, it may actually be that it's not merely that it's their heritage, but they don't question it. I would offer it once again that this is the same thing with secularism, atheism, or agnosticism, or existentialism. Um, I remember, I think it's a quote from Richard Lewontin, if I'm not uh, in error. Doesn't matter. <laughs> the point was is that, uh, you know, a famous biologist, and he actually said that, um, I must be honest, I ingested my atheistic materialism with my broccoli at the dinner table. It is really important to acknowledge that wherever you are actually raised influences your belief systems. If you've been raised, for example, with an atheistic household, and actually religion itself has been disparaged in front of you since you were a little boy, or some other religion because you are religious, in each case this is going to, if you will, twist and warp how you will see that subject, whether or not you even believe that it is worthy of an investigation. As Abdu'l-Baha said above, that the opinion of many cultured men is that religion needs no powers of reflection. Has this happened to many individuals? Yes, these are the quotes we've actually been looking at. It actually has. Many people really don't like the smell of anything religious. But often what I find is that's not because of actually a genuine and often deep knowledge of what those traditions say. It is simply a cultural milieu, a cultural momentum that is carrying us away from something that may be pristinely beautiful. What in the end are some of these examples that we're actually talking about? In the case of the religious world, that seem to do violence to the facts. There are many of them, actually. When we look at the different world religions, we see that apparently there is no God in Buddhism. Buddhism is often portrayed as a purely agnostic, even just purely philosophical way of life. And many things within Buddhism are actually often completely extracted. You'll hear people say there are no hells in Buddhism. You'll actually hear people share the doctrine of anatman, no soul, as something which it doesn't seem to be within the scriptures. Yet on the surface, we seem to see no God. Um, yet when we move to, for example, Christianity, Christianity is often portrayed as a religion wherein there is a triune being, the doctrine known as the Trinity. Yet strangely, that is not a doctrine remotely accepted by either Jews or Muslims. The concept of in Hinduism of Brahman does not seem to actually gel or jive <laughs> um, with the idea of God in the Quran. On the surface, these seem rather different. Even the example, which many do not know of, and there's understandable reasons why, uh, with Zoroastrianism, people have portrayed Zoroastrianism as almost a system of dualism. Two supreme beings, at times presented as equal, one evil, one good, at war. How can these possibly be the same underlying truth? But it goes beyond this because it seems that the doctrines of salvation that are expressed, for example, in Christianity, where one must be cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ and his sacrifice upon the cross, seems in some sense different and quite different from actually a notion of Jewish sacrifice even, something that is often portrayed as if it's very close. But here in Jewish sacrifice, it is actually an abomination to even consider the sacrifice of a human. And secondly, the sacrificial system itself appears within the Old Testament to be something that goes on eternally, an everlasting covenant between God and the people of Israel. 
But what does this have to do, for example, with the notion of nirvana that we find within the Buddhist scriptures? Or even in a sense of moksha, the goal of a religious, devout practice. And isn't even the concept of moksha, as it's represented, for example, in the Upanishads, seem to be quite different than, if you will, the bhakti yoga, the devotional love of Krishna that we find within the Bhagavad Gita. How can these be brought together and seen as a unified whole? It often seems difficult. We seem to find a soul in Christianity. But that notion doesn't seem, at least on the surface, to be the same as the concepts we find within the Old Testament. Can we really see the doctrine of a soul that is represented in the New Testament and the doctrine of an Atman represented in Buddhist writings? Is it not the direct negation of that idea? And those are the questions. Is not Buddhism itself grabbing onto a whole bunch of Vedic and Upanishadic notions and bringing in Vedic beings, Vedic, sorry, Hindu, ancient Hindu beings and ancient Hindu doctrines and ideas, and then actually injecting into it, if you will, things that have no place there and seem to do, if you will, violence to the facts of the Vedas and the Upanishads. These are the questions one has to look at. Um, can we not see, for example, that in Christianity, there was the crucifixion, a central motif of the New Testament. And yet, as many Christians believe, and some Muslims do as well, does not the Quran seem to say that Jesus Christ was never crucified, or that it was a mere semblance? Does not the Quran itself say that Jesus, sorry, that the Prophet Muhammad was the seal of the prophets, and that no prophets can come after him? If so, what of the Baha'i faith? There are many of these, and they're actually, you know, it may seem strange to many, solvable. <laughs> but they are solvable through an honest exploration of these traditions. And this is what we're trying to look at here on this channel, but also in this presentation, ways that we can begin to actually explore these things. And for ourselves to answer our own questions. For as we know, independent investigation of truth is the fundamental principle of the Baha'i faith. Now, as strange as many of these unities might seem, there are a lot of unifications within the intellectual world that we often hear and grow up with that themselves only seem normal and commonplace, I believe, well, because we've grown up with them, because we actually have simply been around them. And what are some of these? Um, one of the first ones that often comes to mind, it's a very simple one. Um, it seems strange, and it would have seemed strange to many, that something like yellow is red, or purple, or blue. That in some sense, when you're seeing the very colors of the rainbow, and many more, that you're actually looking at the expressions and manifestations of one underlying reality. There's an intuitive unity to it, of course, because one might say, well, they're all colors. They, if you will, seem to actually be of a type. They are examples of a certain type of phenomenon. But it's not manifestly obvious at the outset that these could or would be manifestations of one underlying reality. But I think that actually one is quite simple. I, as an individual, when I take myself out of the historical context that I live in, when I think something like um, the stone in my backyard, the living flesh in my hand, the gas in a helium balloon, something that I can breathe and make my voice squeaky, <laughs> that these could actually be manifestations of one fundamental underlying physical constituent. Then in some sense, everything around you is made up of electrons, protons, and neutrons. I know we grow up with this, but it actually seems rather bizarre when you begin to think of it. When you look, for example, at water 
at error and at lead, is there an immediate understanding that, oh, of course, these are the external, if you will, the external properties of the arrangement and structure of some underlying unified reality. I honestly would suggest that to say that this is obvious to you is actually absurd. It is something that we have only, in very recent history, come to really understand. Yes, again, might there be some intuitive truth to this? Might there be something that seems to make this true? Yes, I believe there is. In this section, in essence, when we look at the various elements of our world, the constituents that make up all created things, is it really immediately intuitive that all of them are actually manifestations of some underlying phenomenon? No, I don't think it is. And yet we believe it to be true. And how did we come about discovering this underlying fundamental unity? We did so through investigation, through the application of rational scientific thought, by using philosophical devices, as well as physical devices, to explore them. I think that it's important to actually notice this. I think that even when we look at many of the things, can space and time, as it's proposed in Einsteinian theory, really be two manifestations of one underlying, if you will, fabric? Is that intuitive? And if not intuitive, is it still true? The question of whether or not religion is itself a unified phenomenon, if there is some underlying unity, may actually be false, but that cannot be ascertained unless and until we truly do an investigation. Oftentimes when we look at the biological world, to think that certain biological entities have a common ancestor in the primordial mists of time, for many people seems an obvious fact. But if an obvious fact, then we would deny the brilliance of a Charles Darwin. Just like when it comes to the fundamental unity of the composite matter around us, we would be denying the brilliance of modern day physics. There are different facets of unities that seem to actually be peculiar. For example, when we look at something like computation. How, what is computation? What is even something as simple as addition and subtraction? It can actually be embodied in various underlying physical phenomena. Something that is computing is whatever is computing, whether it be made out of binary code, whether we be doing it on a steam-powered, if you will, analytic engine or difference engine. Please look it up. <laughs> um, how it's actually embodied is not the question. It is itself what is the underlying, if you will, abstract concept that isn't being embodied. Even something as simple as money. When we look at money, and ask what is it, if we begin to study the physical coins themselves, so the physical paper, we'll end up in different domains. Yet it is this abstract concept that unifies the variety of phenomenon we refer to as money. What about a theory? What about an idea? Can we actually embody, for example, the proposition that there is a common biological origin for all the great apes, an aspect of Darwinian theory, and can we actually embody that in ways that on the surface seem radically different? Yes, it's called Mandarin, English, Spanish, and Arabic. We can actually have an underlying propositional unity, a truth functional unity that undergirds the reality that it gets manifested within different linguistic expressions, even so far as to be mere ink upon a page or binary code in a computer. We could carve out the origin of the species, if you will, in you know Sumerian cuneiform wedge writing on clay tablets, and if a true translation would still be that same theory. Can this be seen that the propositions underlying the varied languages, the various scripts, are fundamentally the same thing? Yes, we do this all the time in translations. What is the unity that makes up, for example, Beethoven's Ninth Symphony? When I play it, for example, on my guitar, 
is that the same symphony as that which is actually played, that same song, that which is played for by an entire symphony? I would suggest in some sense yes, in some sense no, but it's definitely not my composition. <laughs> um, this is There is a whole host of things within the reality of our world that when we look at what they are, on their surface they appear very different. The same goes for moral properties, in fact. What is generosity? Is it the giving of money? Is it the giving of time? Is it the giving of food? What is it unites each of these disparate expressions that we bring under the rubric or the term of generosity? What of humility? Can we be humble in many different ways? Can we be honest in many different ways? These are questions, again, that we will investigate in the future on this site. I think in the end, and we have, and if I'm being honest, there are many cases in which Yes, as I've said, there is an intuitive unity to these things. That in some sense we understand that honesty can be expressed in so many different ways, even honesty to ourselves. But that there's some fundamental underlying abstract concept that is being embodied in each of them. When we look at the many things of our physical world, yes, helium seems very different than gold or lead. Something like mercury doesn't seem to be oxygen. Yet, in some way, they are the same stuff. There seems to be something that unites them. Why else would the pre-Socratic philosophers be proposing things like everything is water, in the case of Thales of Miletus? Why would people be proposing that there is some underlying unity if there wasn't some, if you will, like a gist or, an, or, or a type or an essence that was undergirding all of them? For myself, when I began studying the various world religions, there was a similar sentiment. What if? There was a question. What if? What if I'm actually looking at things that actually have been expressed at different times and places, just like the elements of our world, just like the different colors? But in some sense, there is an underlying reality which unites the spiritual narrative of humankind. That was my question. And then I met some Baha'is. An allusion is often made in discussing, for example, within uh, the atheistic world, individuals such as Richard Dawkins. When speaking not in religion, but in the case actually of the biological unity and of common descent. How the processes of evolution could have generated all these various, if you will, biological entities, all these different phenotypes. And people will say, well, just I just can't believe it. And he will say, and I think rightfully in, in many cases, uh, that's the argument from personal incredulity. What you're saying is, I just can't believe that. And we have to recognize that this is not an argument. <laughs> this is not a point even being make and made outside of, I just don't think that's true. Or I can't see how that's true at this point in my life. Or at my level of understanding or my level of knowledge, it doesn't seem to gel with what I believe is true. That is what we're supposed to, as Baha'is, as we've read previously, find understandable. What we're supposed to empathize with. And realize that the responsibility devolves upon us to do our best to communicate how we can see this as being fundamentally unified. The argument from personal incredulity is not an argument. It is a mere brush off, but still we can empathize and offer. The fundamental principles of the prophets are correct and true. The imitations and superstitions which have crept in are at wide variance with the original precepts and commands. Simply put, that many imitations and superstitions have actually crept in, and if, if you will, morph these original precepts. Now, this is a claim that we would have to investigate. Again, the following from Abdu'l-Baha in Paris Talks. All these divisions we see on all sides, all these disputes and opposition, are caused because men cling to ritual and outward observances, and forget the simple underlying truth. It is the outward practices of religion that are so different, and it is they that cause disputes and enmity, while the reality is always the same, 
and one. The reality is the truth, and truth has no division. Truth is God's guidance. It is the light of the world. It is love. It is mercy. These attributes of truth are also human virtues inspired by the Holy Spirit. So let us one and all hold fast to truth, and we shall be free indeed. The day is coming when all the religions of the world will unite, for in principle they are one already. There is no need for division, seeing that it is only the outward forms that separate them. So we find variation, first of all, obviously within the outer practices of religion. There's no doubt that for a Christian, when you look at the expression of the Jewish law, you do not see what you do now. Then when a Muslim actually looks at the structure and systems of Christianity or Judaism, cannot possibly see that what their Quran tells them, how to order society and how to express the divine will, is identical to that which is within the New Testament and the Hebrew Scriptures. Even a Jewish individual cannot remotely claim that what Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and the patriarchs of Judaism were doing is actually what they themselves are performing under the guidance of Moses. Now this isn't to brush, a law, uh, brush off theological or doctrines of salvation, these differences, as we've addressed above, but it's important that these cannot possibly be a rejection of the unity of religion. For were a Christian to object that, say, the Baha'i faith does not have in it the institutions and social structures that he sees within his own faith, he wouldn't stay a Christian, he would have to become a Jew. But then becoming a Jewish individual, if that was a true objection, would have to realize, well, wait a minute, Moses gave us ordinances and commandments that he himself does not acknowledge within the lives of the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. <laughs> And then within themselves have to fall back to something that is only recorded, really, within the books of Moses himself. So there, there appears to be, in some sense, a functional definition, or a propositional definition, in the examples I've just given. That something is a computer as long as it computes. Something is money as long as it actually recognizes instances of transaction, and track some agreed-upon value in the world. Something is the true proposition, the example I gave is, it is the origin of the species and is Darwin's work, even if it's written in Cantonese. Why? Because the underlying propositional truth content of it is actually birthed from Charles Darwin. And I think there is great benefit to actually considering such things and looking at how Really, how is it for a Christian that that which is actually encoded in the Torah is actually, in, in essence, being expressed within Christianity? How is it, even more so, how concepts of the divine, when we get to the more the theological or the soteriological, the study of salvation, how maybe, let's just say maybe, we are actually looking at Cantonese and English, but in actual fact, the original doctrine and precept underneath it is itself being manifested in these two language communities, in these two symbolic representations, but the underlying truth is still the same. Therefore, the foundations of the religious systems are one, because all proceed from the indivisible reality. But the followers of these systems have disagreed. Discord, strife, and warfare have arisen among them. For they have forsaken the foundation, and held to that which is but imitation and semblance. Inasmuch as imitations differ, enmity and dissension have resulted. If Christians of all denominations and divisions should investigate reality, the foundations of Christ will unite them. No enmity or hatred will remain, for they will all be under the one guidance of reality itself. Likewise, in the wider field, if all the existing religious systems will turn away from ancestral imitations and investigate reality, 
seeking the real meaning of the holy books. They will unite and agree upon the same foundation, reality itself. As long as they follow counterfeit doctrines or imitations instead of reality, animosity and discord will exist and increase. In this quote, Abdu'l-Bahá talks about how if Christians of all denominations actually come together and put aside their own traditions and creeds and dogmas, they can actually unite in principle. And in the wider field of existing religions, if people would say, you know, we actually have our interpretation of this holy book. This is our understanding of what it is. What if, in fact, this isn't the only interpretation? This isn't the only understanding of this religious text. How can we see how maybe, from a Buddhist perspective, a Buddha appeared in the West? Potentially, in the physical temple, right? Not of Siddhartha Gautama, but actually in the person of Jesus Christ. Is it possible? And is it potentially the way we have interpreted this that is actually making it impossible for us to actually see a divine light, see the same light in a different lamp there on the other side of the world? So we have these, these semblances and imitations. We have these cultural expressions, if you will, the law of Moses or the sacramental system of Christianity. But we also have this issue of the underlying propositional content. What if they are being communicated in different symbols? What if our interpretation of these symbols? And while this seems unlikely <laughs> to many people, that we would somehow be able to unify the different world religions under one recognition of a common source of the spiritual history of humankind, and many people have shared this with me, how equally unlikely that each of these communities will completely drop what they believe and, for example, become atheist or become secular or New Age. How the Baha'is see this is not simply that there is an intellectual process going on where many people sit down, and of course it, it refers to actually seeking the meanings of the holy books in this quote, but it's not merely that. It is actually that this is the will of God for humankind in this day. And that there are processes at work within society that are forcing us to actually address these issues, to come together and to investigate. Buddha also established a new religion, and Confucius renewed the ancient conduct and morals. But the original precepts have been entirely changed, and their followers no longer adhere to the original pattern of belief and worship. The founder of Buddhism was a precious being who established the oneness of God. But later his original precepts were gradually forgotten and displaced by primitive customs and rituals, until in the end, it led to the worship of statues and images. It's important to note here in this quote that Abdu'l-Bahá is stating that Confucius was a renewer of what? Ancient conduct and morals. Not that he was a manifestation of God, but it's using this very large social movement, this very large social and moral philosophy, and saying that its precepts have been entirely changed in the face of the process of history. It is parallel with what happened to Buddhism, that the original precepts are gradually forgotten and displaced. We move on. Consider, for example, that Christ admonished the people time and again to heed the Ten Commandments of the Torah and insisted upon their strict observance. Now, one of the Ten Commandments forbids the worship of images and statues. Yet today there are myriad images and statues in the churches of certain Christian denominations. It is clear and evident, then, that the religion of God does not preserve its original precepts among the people, but that it is gradually changed and altered to the point of being entirely effaced and thus a new manifestation appears and a new religion is established. For if the former religion had not been changed and altered, there would be no need for renewal. In this quote, in the second part of this quote, Abdu'l-Bahá then compares the current standing of Christianity with what had happened to Buddhism and, another example, Confucianism. And it's saying 
that it does not preserve its original precepts among the people. Now we know, given the Baha'i writings, on the status of the New Testament, the holiness of this text, that it is not stating that we lost the New Testament. Even the Quran openly states that the book is in the hands of the people, as you can see in another one of our videos. But here, it's saying it's gradually being changed and altered, and things are being displaced, and that suddenly innovations, beliefs, and practices came into the tradition that were not its original intent, that begin to actually shift it to a point where the original intent was being lost. Abdu'l-Bah also states that the remedy here, as it might have seemed so far, is simply to work back within these traditions to the original precepts. What does he actually state is the remedy itself? The remedy itself, as he is stating it, is what? And thus a new manifestation appears and a new religion is established that there comes to be sort of an effacing or disruption of the original intent, and it becomes very, very difficult, near not well nigh impossible, to truly actually simply through human innovation and human effort to actually bring people back to its original teaching. But rather, a new theory is brought forward, a new perspective that actually cuts through much of the, if you will, underbrush that is blocking our vision so that we can come back to its original intent. In the beginning, this tree was full of vitality and laden with blossoms and fruit. But gradually it grew old, spent and barren, until it entirely withered and decayed. That is why the true gardener will again plant a tender sapling of the same stock, that it may grow and develop day by day extend its sheltering shade in this heavenly garden, and yield its prized fruit. So it is with the divine religions. With the passage of time, their original precepts are altered. Their underlying truth entirely vanishes. Their spirit departs. Doctrinal innovations spring up, and they become a body without a soul. That is why they are renewed. So the original precepts are altered. The truths themselves get covered over. And it's interesting here, it says, the spirit departs, doctrinal innovations spring up, and they become a body without a soul. That is why they are renewed. That there's a different, there's different aspects of the Baha'i teachings. One is this of progressive revelation, of the divine physician actually bringing a teaching to humankind that is actually tailored for their age. But it's also that many of the doctrinal innovations and the traditions and superstitions that, if you will, have crept into the foundation of actually these religions necessitate that a new sapling of the same stock be placed. And that that former teachings, the former community, in a sense, be actually brought under the sway of this new sapling as it grows up with the DNA of the original stock. So they are, in a sense, renewed, born again. Our meaning is that the followers of Buddha and Confucius now worship images and statues and have become entirely unaware of the oneness of God, believing instead in imaginary gods, as did the ancient Greeks, but such were not their original precepts. Indeed, their original precepts and conduct were entirely different. So, it's interesting here that even in the case of the Greeks, that actually Abdu'l-Baha is stating that they come to actually worship these imaginary gods. We actually find this actually in the New Testament, that they turned from the unknowable God and began to worship the image of men and of creeping things and of beasts. That really the customs and traditions and creeds and dogmas and innovations once again slowly creep in and hide the original tent of the revelation. Again, consider to what an extent the original precepts of the Christian religion have been forgotten and how many doctrinal innovations have sprung up. For example, Christ forbade violence and revenge and enjoined instead that evil and injury be met with benevolence and loving-kindness. 
But observe how many bloody wars have taken place among the Christian nations themselves, and how much oppression, cruelty, rapacity, and bloodthirstiness have resulted therefrom. Indeed, many of these wars were carried out at the behest of the popes. It is therefore abundantly clear that, with the passage of time, religions are entirely changed and altered, and hence they are renewed. Much of this idea of the innovations and dogmas and creeds is very difficult to deny when one actually looks at the history of these traditions. There are numerous denominations, numerous schisms that have happened, and separations and divisions that have occurred within the world religions. Very often to the point where, depressingly, you will actually have a Christian from one denomination not willing to speak or associate with actually another denomination, where they are so at odds. And you don't only have this, have this in Christianity. This happens in Buddhism, in Hinduism even. And it's important to know that these are not monolithic communities. They're often misrepresented as such. People will say things like, Christians believe, or Buddhists believe. Or in actual fact, it should be, well, some Buddhists believe this, or some Christians believe that. Some Muslims have this view, right? Some Hindus have this interpretation. These are not monolithic communities, which is an evidence of this in innovation and this interpolation, these coming in of actual traditions. This is why Abdul Baha speaks so much of mere imitation as opposed to investigating the underlying reality. And yes, you have this aspect where the Muslim looks at Christianity through the lens of Islam. The Christian looks at Judaism through the lens of the New Testament. And again, even a Jewish individual who follows the law of Moses sees the lives of the patriarch, the stories of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, those early heritage of the Jewish faith through the eyes of Moses. A Buddhist looks at Hinduism through the perspective of the sutras of the Buddha. Likewise, a Baha'i tries to understand these prior revelations, which have undeniably been encrusted and separated through the vision of Baha'u'llah. And it is not necessary, it is not in the sense saying, and we will look at this again, that actually we have a, are looking at the real scripture, rather we are offering an interpretation, and that interpretation and understanding of those scriptures has to be weighed in the balances of rationality, of its fruitfulness for humankind, of its ability to unify different phenomena and different teachings, of its ability to solve problems, like any rational scientific theory when it is offered to humankind. Does it deal with the, the evidence? Does it actually unify our understanding? Does it simplify our conception, in this case, of the divine? In the next video, we're going to be looking at some of these avenues of approach, ways that we can begin to explore these religions and to ex explore, in a sense, the divergencies that we seem to see. What are the tools that we can begin to use to look at religion as the varied expressions of one underlying reality, the many different colors, if you will, of one fundamental source. How can we begin to explore this and see the human religious history as the many chapters of one book, the many love letters written by the Divine Friend to humankind?